this series, I speak with eight incredible thinkers in Africa, people working to solve complex challenges across the board. We discuss the civic space in Africa, the physical and online spaces where people come together to exercise their rights in shaping our societies. The civic space is important because it provides everyone with an opportunity to contribute to a thriving, inclusive society. Join us for these diverse topics, from ensuring technology positively serves society to ensuring that communities come together to increase women and youth's participation in decision making. What are some of the challenges uh, that African countries have faced because of big tech? Um, just, just generally, mm. what are some of the challenges you think we are currently facing because of a lack of moderation? Mm. So one of the challenges we faced is that because Facebook offers free access to um, its basic um, platform, um, Facebook is the only way that many Africans, Facebook, WhatsApp, and to a lesser ext extent in Instagram, is the only way many African communities even get access to information. But then the news feed pushes information that makes people angry, that outrages them. And that outrage has had offline consequences. There have been attacks, there have been massacres, there have been ethnic mobilizations that have taken place, not just on the continent, but also in East Asia, and to a lesser extent in, in other parts of the world, as a consequence of the false information that has been peddled on this platform that is people's only gateway to the internet, the only access that people have to the, the World Wide Web. Um, so yes, we have, we've suffered the consequences and even the, the manipulation that takes place by outside players, by state and non-state actors. We've heard about Cambridge Analytica. We know that in the United States they're investigating the Russian government even for interference in electoral processes. The channels through which they did this work was social media. That was the channel through which they manipulated people, suppressed voter uh, populations, psychologically messed around with people. A lot of the testing grounds were here in Africa, in Kenya and in South Africa. They tested these methodologies. Um, they tested them in, 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 in the Caribbean as well. Uh, you know, testing the ability, you know, to to dial up tensions and to you know, increase anxiety to the extent that you can manipulate what people do and then opening up that market uh, to players so who a lot want of rage to use bait. it to, to, to win and, and lose elections. Yeah. I believe Cambridge Analytica was running like psychological mm -hmm. analyses without people's consent using Facebook. This is devastating stuff. So yeah, um, African countries are usually the first mover, the playground, the sandbox in which these organizations practice their techniques, and then they once they've harnessed them and perfected them, they, they move them offshore. Well, I hear you saying there are two levels of civic engagement. There's before the ballot, during the ballot, and after the ballot. Yes. So during the period where someone has been elected, an official has been elected, citizens can actually engage and should engage, but they're unaware of this engagement, and there's a need for us to shift and focus on how we can increase that civic awareness. What are the ways and strategies you would recommend for organizations and governments to increase that engagement? So we are doing it by using technology, actually. We've created a civic education learning app um, that is an online platform that is available in app stores that young people can use to watch short videos, bite-sized learning opportunities um, about exactly these issues. Um, who polices the police? You do. Uh, who decides how budgets get spent? You, you do. do. <laughs> Et cetera, et cetera. What does a member of parliament do? How does the president get elected? What has the uptake been, the reaction, the feedback from young people especially? Mm -hmm. So the uptake has been almost exclusively amongst young people online. Okay. And we've partnered with civil society organizations um, who are using our online materials to teach offline. Um, we are also training civil society trainers so that they can log in and use it as a teaching tool in their own communities. And in the long term, we want to find out if we too can be zero rated yeah. <laughs> so that network operators will allow people to access this publicly available free and independently verified educational program. It's been ve um, verified by constitutional experts, um, can access this information so that they can become more active citizens. Um, we've also partnered with the IEC, the Independent Electoral Commission in South Africa. So we are a civil society partner of theirs that amplifies their information about registration, 
uh, voter participation, the process in the run-up to the election. So even though government may not have full resources, there's room and space for yes. partnerships with civil society organisations yes. to ensure the amplification of work. Yes, and what's great about the Independent Electoral Commission is that they welcome this kind of partnership because they've had funding cuts. And a lot of conspiracy theorists have said, you know, the IEC has had its funding cuts because people don't want us to have a free and fair election. It's actually much more mundane than that. Budget cuts usually happen in spaces where people think no one will notice or it doesn't matter. It's a symbol of how little care there is mm. in our legislature for the importance of the electoral, in, the integrity of the electoral process. So we can swing in from the outside as civil society organizations, partner with this institution and help it to disseminate information. And I think what's been really powerful in this election cycle in South Africa is we have the most registrations that we've ever had in our history, ever, in South Africa. That's 27, incredible. 27 million people have registered to vote in this election. It's the most we've ever had. We now need to see if that will follow through in the vote. So usually out of about 25 million or 22, about 15 million will turn out to vote, sometimes closer to 20. Um, I would really consider it a success if more young people participate in this election in South Africa than have ever participated in any previous election. We've already broken the registration record. We need to see if we can increase those numbers and then create information, access to information that empowers them, having voted, to feel as though, right, this is my government, these are my representatives, I have a duty to hold them to account for their leadership in between so elections. It's important for young people to have a sense of ownership, not just of their leaders, but of the process. I also think it's important for young people to feel like leaders fear them, not that ah. they fear leaders. Okay. At the moment, See our the people way fear our leaders. Absolutely. We treat them as though they are kings and queens. They are monarchies, right? And we appeal to them to help us and to do things for us. We don't have to appeal to them for anything. They work for us. They are public servants. And once we can change that relationship, and I think one of the ways to change it is to give people the information about how it really works. Every time I think of the word politician in my head, and it's something I'm working to change, it's a dirty word. So if someone says, Natasha, you're such a politician, I'm like, they're calling me a criminal. You know, how do you think differently or how can we think differently about the word politician? So more younger people, more people in business can say, listen, I want to engage and participate. Mm -hmm. So I feel very frustrated whenever I hear that because there are many good people in politics and government. And I don't want this whole conversation to give the impression that I also think men in politics or older leaders in politics are all useless. They're really not. They're just overrepresented. Um, the truth is that there are good leaders in our society who are doing the best that they can with the limited resources they have. And now we need more of them. We need a critical mass of them. That's what's going to change the narrative about politicians. The notion that politicians are dirty is because the stories we read about politicians are primarily about the ones who are crooked. It's not primarily about the ones who are doing incredible work. And I think that's one of the ways in which women and young people, you know, when you're a first, the camera's on you. And then that's an opportunity for you to model a different kind of leadership, to demonstrate that you can be a politician, but you can also be a person of integrity um, and a person who has values. Um, I think that's also one of the ways we can shift the narrative is by having more young people, more women, busting sort of the, the stereotype of what a political leader looks like and changing the narrative about what politics is. So there's space and room to shift how we think about politics and politicians on the continent. And citizenship. We need to shift, shift our, our belief system and our way of thinking about political leadership and about citizenship. Who what it is to be a citizen. We're not passive, we're not victims. We, we have the power through the ballot and through the institutions that exist, which we have to protect to ensure they continue to exist. Absolutely. Because also the destruction of institutions happens without scrutiny. When there is no scrutiny, the, the destruction is easy. So we have what institutions we have and what systems and processes we do have, we need to fight for and we have to protect and we have to use them to get our democracies to be more robust, more effective, more representative, and more capable of delivering justice for more people. You've been listening to Talk To Me Direct. Follow and subscribe on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts.